Our featured attraction, of course, this evening is um, is the great Steve Inskeep, uh, who I'm sure is already familiar to um, to many of you. Certainly, those of you who listen to uh, National Public Radio, uh, he's been an on-air presence there for for 19 years, uh, and for over a decade now, he's been uh, one of the hosts of a Morning Edition, the most widely heard radio news pr program in the United States. I mean, I take your guys' word for it, right? Um, and uh, uh, Steve uh, appeared uh, here at PNP um, three and a half years ago when his first book was published, uh, Instant City, uh, which chronicled a day in the life of uh, Karachi, P Pakistan. Uh, and he's back now to talk about his second book, uh, Jackson Land. Uh, in it, Steve goes not abroad, but back in time uh, in the United States to the era of Andrew Jackson. Uh, he tells the story not only of Jackson, but of John Ross, the tribal chief of the Cherokee. Uh, once military comrades, these two men ended up on opposing sides of an epic struggle over land seizure and resettlement of Native American tribes that severely tested America's young democracy. Uh, it was a transformative chapter uh, in our nation's development and also a very tragic one. Uh, and as Steve notes in his acknowledgments, Authors uh, have grappled with that period and its protagonists in different ways at, at different times since. Uh, Jackson has been portrayed variously as the uh, hero of democracy uh, and a um, malevolent Indian hater, Ross as both the Moses of his people and a stubborn egotist, uh, and the expulsion of the Indians or a Trail of Tears uh, has been treated as a uh, either a practical, inevitable response to the needs of white settlement or a shameful low point in American history. Steve recounts this complex emotional story in a very well-researched, balanced, confident, and lively way. Um, heartbreaking and regrettable as that episode was, it continues to resonate uh, in present-day societal tensions between those who espouse the rule of the majority and those who champion the rights of the minority, which makes Steve's book not just a tale of the past, but a lesson for the present and future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Steve Inski. Thank you, good evening. That was such a good introduction, I'm tempted to just stop and uh, <laughs> leave it there and ask you to buy the book. Thank you very much. It is really, really an honor to be here at what I know, having traveled around, is one of the best independent bookstores in the United States. And one of the most vital. It's an honor also to know that there are one or two colleagues from NPR, several colleagues, I guess, from NPR here tonight. Um, I learn so much from my colleagues, I benefit so much from working with my colleagues, and I even get to take credit for some of their work, which is very nice. Every now and again, I run into somebody on the street, and they say, that was a great show this morning, it was amazing, and I have to say, thank you, I was off today. <laughs> they just kind of assume I'm there. You know, it's David Green, it's actually Renee Montaigne, it's incredible reporting by Ari Shapiro, incredible work behind the scenes, and sometimes I'm there and sometimes I'm not, but it's an honor. It's an honor to work with them. And it's an honor to be with you, you here tonight for my first public event for this book. Uh, I have been eager to fling this book out on the world for quite some time. In fact, I've had an image uh, in, my, in my mind of actually flinging it. I won't do that because my lovely wife, Carolee, is in the third row and I would not like to injure, <laughs> injure her. This is, as Bradley so eloquently said, a story of two men, Andrew Jackson and John Ross. It's a story of their battle over land and it's a story of American democracy. It's set in an era when the democracy that we know began to take shape. It was almost 200 years ago but it feels ever present when you begin to get into the material. We did a very small uh, signing of some books yesterday at NPR, and there were some people lined up, and 
Within a few minutes, someone introduced herself and said that she had Creek Indian ancestry, and another person had Cherokee ancestry, and then another person had Cherokee ancestry and a connection to Andrew Jackson's family. And then a woman hands me a book and says, would you please sign it for a man who named his son after Andrew Jackson? Then today, I was on the telephone with a man from Knoxville, Tennessee, which is one of the places I'm supposed to go uh, for this book. You know that Andrew Jackson is from Tennessee. And I'm supposed to speak in a theater called the Bijou Theater, about which I knew nothing until this man told me that it is partly a building that's been there since the early 1800s. And the people who've been in that building before me include Andrew Jackson. This feels very present. And it feels very present when you get into the material as well. Even though it also is a distant and different place, going into this story feels to me sometimes like being in a dream where you see people that you recognize, but they're doing different things. Or people who are normally not together in your life are suddenly together. Everything is recognizable, but at the same time foreign. It begins with John Ross at the age of 22 on a river journey on the Tennessee River, which zigzags in and out of the state of Tennessee through Alabama and some other states on the way to the Ohio and then the Mississippi. He's going with the current, which is really the only practical way to go on a boat, um, and going down river through what is then wilderness. And I write here that anyone covertly studying the boat would have seen four men on board. Ross was black-haired, brown-eyed, slight, but handsome. Each of his three companions could be described in a phrase. A Cherokee interpreter, an older Cherokee man named Calcity, and a servant, as the man was called. But Ross was harder to categorize. He was the son of a Scottish trader whose family had lived among Cherokees for generations in their homeland in the southern Appalachians. Ross, at age 22, was an aspiring trader himself, yet he also had a solid claim to his identity as an Indian, a man of mixed race. He'd grown up among Cherokee children and, in keeping with Cherokee custom, received a new name at adulthood, Kuiskui, said to be a species of bird. My 10-year-old now goes around saying, call me that, call me Kuiskui. That's a good name. I like that. From now on, I will only answer that name, she says. Whether he was a white man or an Indian became a matter of life and death on December 28, 1812. In Kentucky, as Ross later recorded in a letter, we was hailed by a party of white men. The men on the riverbank called for the boat to come closer. Ross asked what they wanted. Give us the news. Something bothered Ross about the men. I told them we had no news worth their attention. And now the white men revealed their purpose. One shouted that they had orders from a garrison of soldiers nearby to stop every boat descending the river to examine if any Indians was on board, as they were not permitted to come about that place. Come to us, the men concluded, or we will come to you. Ross didn't come. Damn my soul if those two are not Indians, one of the men shouted, referring to two of Ross's crew. The man added that he would gather a company of men to pursue and kill them. Ross claimed that one of his companions was Spanish, not Indian. The man spoke some Spanish to try to persuade the white men of that, but didn't succeed. Finally, the men said that it was an Indian boat and mounted their horses and galloped off. Ross had to assume the men were serious. It was 1812. The United States had declared war on Britain earlier that year, and a number of Indian nations had effectively taken the British side. They'd risen up against the white settlers who they felt were oppressing them and taking their land. The frontier was in turmoil. The white horsemen would not pause to find out that Ross's Cherokees were actually loyal to the United States. And the Cherokees on that boat could only travel in one direction. They had little chance to escape if the men on horseback arranged an unpleasant reception downstream. Now this is one of the moments that feels very modern to me. Ross decided on a precaution 
he whitened the boat. He told the horsemen there were in, no Indians on board, and the best chance of safety was to make that claim appear true. So he modified the racial composition of his crew, leaving only those who could pass as non-Indian. Ross could pass, as could the Cherokee interpreter, who, like Ross, was an English speaker and a mixed blood, parlance for part white and part Indian. The servant, who may have been a black man, would be ignored. Only old Calcity was a full-blooded Cherokee with no chance to fool anybody. His mere presence might even cause the others to be perceived as Indians. This apparently was Ross's thinking because he confided later in a letter, we concluded it was good policy to let Calcity out of the boat. This old man was set off overland and was told to meet the craft later. The remaining crew put their poles in the water and shoved the keelboat keel toward whatever lay ahead. They spent two anxious days in the water, and Calcity had a disagreeable walk of about 30 miles, probably along the bank opposite from where they'd seen the horsemen. Finally, the old man rejoined the boat downstream, and they floated to a safe haven, Fort Massac, on the Ohio River, which was manned by professional soldiers who could tell friend from foe. The horseman never reappeared. Reflecting on this afterward, Ross said he was convinced that the independent manner in which I answered the horseman had confounded their apprehension of being an Indian boat. Indians were supposed to be children of the woods, in a common phrase of the era, dangerous but not so bright, and expected to address white men respectfully as elder brothers. Ross a Cherokee had talked back to the men in clear and defiant English, which means that the future leader of the Cherokee nation had passed as white. You see here evidence of how tremendously diverse the United States was at this very young moment. You see here a country in which there is a collision of different kinds of people who are trying to figure out their identities in a changing world, figure out their place in a changing world, and sometimes for their own safety obscure their identities in a changing world, trying to figure out how it all works. It's a dynamic country in the early 1800s. It's growing at a tremendously rapid pace, going up by millions of people every decade. The country was only two or three million at the time of the revolution, was something like 12 million by around 1830. Growing massively, and that growing population was moving west. And the iconic man moving west, the iconic frontier leader was Andrew Jackson. We know him as a kind of hero of democracy because he came from very poor beginnings. His father died shortly before he was born. His mother died when he was in his early teens of cholera during the American Revolution. He started life with almost nothing. There was one point when he received an inheritance and he did what you would do with an inheritance if you were a parentless teenager. I mean, the natural thing to do, the prudent thing to do, you go to Charleston, South Carolina, and you gamble it all away. He then moved west to try to make a living, got drunk and brawled along the way. There are stories of him uh, partying all night in a tavern with some of his friends, and when they were done, they decided to mark the occasion by burning the, the tables and chairs in the fireplace, breaking them apart, throwing them in the fireplace, and setting everything on fire, and smashing every glass bottle that they had emptied in the course of the evening. Fascinating guy self-educated, became a lawyer in the way that people became lawyers on the frontier. In fact, in most of America at that time, you would study with another lawyer and pretty much figure it all out yourself and start arguing cases in court. When the cases did not go well for Andrew Jackson, he would challenge rival lawyers to duels, <laughs> which would sometimes be negotiated away to nothing and sometimes not so much. And I want to describe a moment after Andrew Jackson had made it all the way west to Tennessee, which was pretty far west in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Jackson was born in 1767. Anything over the Appalachians was regarded as the west. He made it all the way to Nashville, 
He became a farmer, which is a kind way to say that he was a plantation slave owner. He became a politician, um, but he was always something of a wild man or seen as something of a wild man, although I argue in the book that he had remarkable self-control when he thought it suited his interests and had a terrible temper when he thought that suited his interests. <laughs> Controversy followed the whip-thin politician with the wiry hair. Although his ownership of slaves was unremarkable in Tennessee, he sometimes engaged in slave dealing, a business that even slave owners considered disreputable. He also endured criticism for his continuing tendency to challenge other men to duels, a practice that remained common but illegal. In 1806, Jackson let an exchange of insults with a Nashville man escalate into a duel and resolved to kill his opponent. Jackson let the other man shoot first, took a lead ball near his heart that would remain in his body for the rest of his life, yet remained standing, according to the best accounts of this duel. He took time to be sure of his aim before firing a fatal shot in return. Unfortunately for Jackson, his antagonist was a popular young man whose death stained Jackson's reputation, and that reputation was already colored by scandal. It was widely known that he had been together with Rachel, his wife, for years before she completed her divorce from an abusive husband. Rachel and Andrew lived as husband and wife from 1790 or 91 onward, even though the formal decree ending her previous marriage didn't arrive until 1793. They had to be remarried in 1794 to clear up doubts about their status, but having married, they cultivated a conventional family life. With no children of their own, they adopted their son, Andrew Jr., from Rachel's relatives. When Jackson traveled, his miserable wife wrote him letters urging him to hurry home. He wrote back tenderly to express regret that he could not. The muddled circumstances of his marriage proved to be characteristic of Andrew Jackson. He took counsel of what he wanted, what his friends desired, and what he felt to be right. He was guided less by the norms of society than what he considered just, as he wrote in his letters, often capitalizing that word, J-U-S-T. For his marriage to Rachel, the most romantic act of his life, he was willing to endure decades of whispers and insults. A darker manifestation of this same characteristic came out in his slave trading, the social convention that it was acceptable to own human beings as property, but that only low-down characters would engage in the slave trade, would have been just the sort of elaborate hypocrisy by which Jackson refused to be governed. Modern readers can wish that he resolved this hypocrisy by rejecting both practices. Instead, he embraced them both when it suited his interests. His approach to slavery foreshadowed his approach to federal Indian policy. He would reject what he saw as its false piety and rewrite the policy in the way that suited people like himself. I want to say something else about him here. For the first 45, 46, 47 years of this man's life, the record of Jackson's career suggests a talented man thrashing about in the dark, trying to locate a ladder that no man of his background had ever climbed. His speeches made an impression in the House of Representatives. He was Tennessee's first congressman, but he left his seat. Served briefly in the Senate, but quit that too. Became a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court. Won election in 1802 as major general in command of the Tennessee militia, but for years couldn't find any wars to fight. He was very disappointed by this. He tried to start wars, didn't succeed. Like many a Westerner, he speculated in land. He bought and sold the rights to tens of thousands of acres, including land alongside the Mississippi River that eventually became Memphis. It was common for speculators to buy the rights to Indian land in the West and then press their politicians to clear it of Indians pressure that Jackson, as a politician himself, was well connected to apply. But he made the mistake of dealing with men more dreamy-eyed than he was. And when one of his land sales unraveled, Jackson struggled to avoid bankruptcy and the risk of debtor's prison. All of that was before the War of 1812, when his military and diplomatic triumphs opened new horizons for a man with a real estate background and business connections. <laughs> 
During the war, he was a general in command of an army. When it was over, he applied his relentless energy to the conquest of acreage. And that is the heart of the story of Jackson land. It's about the land. It begins in the War of 1812, continues for more than 20 years after. And we trace Jackson's efforts as a general and then as President of the United States to clear Native American nations from the eastern half of what we now think of as the United States, from east of the Mississippi, primarily five powerful nations in the south, one of whom was the Cherokee Nation, centered on North Georgia and several surrounding states. Now, when you buy this book, and I know you're all going to buy this book, right? You'll see a number of maps, which I will want you to keep in your head, because in the early 19th century, the landed issue, quite a few future American states, could be represented on two mutually incompatible maps, mutually exclusive maps. There was a white man's map and an Indian map. The white man's map somewhat resembled the map of the United States. Today you had all these states and territories, many of them distinguished by uh, straight lines drawn right across the map. And then you had a map of Indian nations, much of the same land usually delineated by squiggly lines representing the tops of ridges or rivers or other natural landmarks. It was the same land twice. And the federal government in Washington for many decades recognized both, recognized both maps. It had its reasons to embrace ambiguity. The legal reality was the Indian map. There was a United States, there was land that was recognized that belonged to the United States along the coast, and there were Indian nations which had been independent nations since before the arrival of European settlers. The ambition was the white man's map, the map of the United States. And the heart of this story is how that conflict over the course of more than 20 years was resolved. And the, in my mind, titanic struggle between two heroic but flawed human beings who were at the center of it all again and again and again. I want to read one more bit of Jackson Land and then invite some of your questions. I just want to mention that there were a lot of different ways that land was contended over in these 20 years. There were wars. There were massacres. More often there were treaties, treaty negotiations, bribes paid, deals made, people coerced and threatened uh, and pushed aside, and sometimes they pushed back. I want to recount one bit of an episode from 1820. This is a time when John Ross is a little bit older. Andrew Jackson is still a general. He's now a major general of the United States Army, basically in charge of the South. And Ross is rising in the leadership of the Cherokee Nation. He's on his way to becoming the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. Cherokees, as some of you may know, had made an effort to modernize their society, to make it more compatible with white civilization, this encroaching white civilization. They had changed their clothing. They had changed their architecture. They had changed their style of business. They were even on their way to changing their government. As John Ross rose in Cherokee leadership, one of the things that he took a lead in doing was creating a constitution for the Cherokee Nation modeled on that of the United States. It begins, we the people of the Cherokee Nation. You can see the, when you put them side by side, you can see the influence there. And you can see what Ross was trying to do. He wanted to make the Cherokee Nation a kind of territory or eventually a state within the Union, within the United States. He actually said in a letter, we consider ourselves a part of the great family of the Republic of the United States. This was a group of people whose leaders at least, although there was some opposition within the nation, whose leaders had chosen to try to join this new vast country that was approaching them. 
I've come to think of them as people who were like immigrants assimilating to a new country except the new country was coming to them. And they were trying to keep from being deported from that country which had come to them. In 1820, they still controlled a substantial amount of land in North Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and near my friend Marshall's uh, home. I see Marshall here this evening. Thank you for wearing a tie. I'm glad one other person wore a tie. That's great. <laughs> Makes me less embarrassed. John Ross was part of the Cherokee leadership attempting to defend that land, and you had people we would describe as squatters white families who were moving onto Cherokee territory and simply grabbing farms, setting up farms and working farms and staying there until someone kicked them out. The Cherokees asked the United States military to do something about this as they were legally required to do. This required John Ross to write General Andrew Jackson and ask for help. Amazingly, General Jackson did not have any troops to spare for this job. They were busy clearing shrubs on a highway and doing other important things. It's clear that the leaders of the United States wanted one thing to happen. They wanted Indian nations to move. Finally, Jackson suggested to the Cherokees that if they wanted to clear the squatters, the intruders as they were called, off their land, they should just do it themselves. And so they started a military unit or reorganized a military unit that had been in existence for some time called the Cherokee Light Horse. And this group of cavalry went out under the command of John Ross and went to the first farm of a man named Atkinson, who had threatened, in various ways, violent opposition if anyone came to kick him off his land. And so the Cherokees came, and they arrived at the farm and found no one around. They didn't know if somebody was hiding in the woods. They didn't know where anybody was. The farm had been abandoned food lying around as if people had just left. And the Cherokee Light Horse set about destroying the crops that had been accumulated on this farm. You had to destroy things or people would not, simply would not leave. But this is the remarkable thing that happened. As his men set aflame the food stores at the farm, John Ross had been waiting for the response. The sound of hooves, the gunshot from the woods, but when he saw figures approaching at length, it was not a party of white gunmen. It was one man, one woman, some children. And Ross wrote in a letter, Atkinson came across the river, which was the boundary, came across the river with his wife and family to defend it, to defend his farm, not by the force of powder and lead, but by the shedding of tears. This unexpected weapon of defense had more effect on the minds of the men than if he had resorted to the manners threatened, the measures threatened. His conviction of error and pitiful acknowledgments, etc., etc., induced me to permit him to recross the river to the white side, that's what he called white territory, unmolested with a few sheep and geese. His crop was all destroyed. Ross was angry. Ross felt that white intruders were part of a grand plan to grab Cherokee land, which they were. But he couldn't do the maximum to this man. He let the man get away with his livestock. He watched Atkinson go away, driving his livestock before him, which was probably all he owned. Though the strategy of gaining great strips of land for white settlement was a central project of the frontier elite Illegally occupying Indian land was a job for the poor. Not just any farmer would risk his life, labor, and possessions to improve land that might be snatched back. This white farmer had probably taken Cherokee property because he could not afford the abundant real estate that was on sale nearby in Alabama. Atkinson did not even have the support of relatives or other white Tennesseans because nobody had rallied to help defend his farm. Surely his poverty was evident to Ross as soon as his weeping family appeared. And Ross let the man go. Ross wrote all this in a letter to Andrew Jackson, reporting what he had done, and ended it, I have the honor to be, sir, your very obedient, humble servant, John Ross. While Jackson's reply to this note, if any, has not survived, it is easy to calculate from other letters what Jackson 
thought of it. He almost certainly disapproved. Andrew Jackson would never have let Atkinson walk away. Jackson believed it was a mistake to allow white squatters to depart with their livestock. The squatters would simply wait until the troops had moved on and then return. While Jackson showed little enthusiasm for removing white settlers, he had none at all for doing a job badly or for giving anyone a chance to flout his will. If white settlers were to be removed at all, the job should be thoroughly and irresistibly done. Once his troops finally arrived, he would order them to hold white settlers and deliver them to the nearest civilian lawman for prosecution. And here was a subtle but significant difference between these two men who would contend for land over the years that followed. Andrew Jackson could show mercy and respect. He could have empathy for others. He could never have succeeded as a politician otherwise. But those qualities were governed by his ruthlessness. He must never lose a fight. He must always uphold his authority. Ross, too, proved to be fiercely and stubbornly competitive. But there were moments when Ross let his stubbornness give way to generosity. And Ross hoped to justice, which is what John Ross would seek over the next 18 years leading up to what we learn about in school, the Trail of Tears. I appreciate what Bradley said at the beginning, that this is much greater detail of a story that perhaps you think you know. And you discover there's so much more to it. And it is so closely related to the time in which we live. The book is Jackson Land. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll And I'll welcome you to take your questions. There is a microphone here. Is this the only microphone? So go ahead and line up there. And if you do me a favor, would you say your name so that we can get to know each other a bit and go ahead and ask a direct question? Fire away, sir. Sure. My name is Bert Rood. And you said this is a longstanding interest of yours. Where is that coming from? Uh, some of it comes from my day job. Uh, I feel that this is something that, that is very closely connected to the news that I cover. Um, I know this will shock you, but three or four years ago, I grew a little discouraged about the state of politics in, in, this, in this country. <laughs> um, and that drove me in a couple of different directions. One of the ways it drove me was to rye whiskey. <laughs> America was drunk on rye for the whole 19th century. I discovered it was coming back. I bought a few bottles of rye. I bought a few more bottles of rye. But it also drove me into history more directly. I'd always been fascinated by the 1830s, by this period when American democracy began. And I began researching and found this story, which I'd learned a paragraph or a page about in elementary school or junior high school, sometime in school. I have a memory of studying this for a minute. Um, and it felt really visceral and really alive to me even now. And I began researching it and learning more and more. And it felt really current. Jackson Land, the name that I give to this book, uh, is my description of the land of the American South, which Andrew Jackson obtained through wars, treaties, and a variety of other means. It is all of Florida. It is most of Alabama. It's a good part of Georgia, a good part of Tennessee, part of North Carolina. It is uh, much of Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Western Tennessee, Kentucky. Uh, it's a lot of land. It's also this city where I work. It's Washington, D.C. It's the White House, or the Executive Mansion, as it was called then. It's the House of Representatives, this kind of temple of democracy which met in those days in Statuary Hall at the Capitol. Have you guys been in Statuary Hall? Just a beautiful semicircular building at the Capitol, now filled with statues sent from every state in the Union, one of whom is Sequoia, the inventor of the written Cherokee language who was sent here by Oklahoma, which is where Cherokees ended up after they were expelled from the Appalachians partly because of a vote in that room, Statuary Hall, to very narrowly approve a bill called the Indian Removal Act, which was conceived of by Jackson's administration, passed very narrowly by his supporters, and signed by <coughs> President Andrew Jackson in 1830. So to me, this became an opportunity to look at my day job in a completely different and deeper way. 
to understand both the similarities and differences between this time and that time. We're in this moment where the country is changing so radically, so rapidly, demographically and other, in other ways. There's so many different kinds of people from all around the world who've come here and our continuing challenge is to work through our differences in a democracy, respect the rights of every minority, while also maintaining ourselves as one nation. Please go ahead, ma'am. Uh, my name is Ginny Finch. Uh, Hi. On the, um, Steve, on the uh, um, PBS News Hour, you said there was an alternative stra expansion strategy um, that Johnson, uh, that Jackson could have used, but it was very difficult. Um, I'd like to know what that alternative, kinder uh, strategy was, and how much, if at all, he. Uh, uh, you know, pursued it. Of course. First, thanks for mentioning the news hour. Yes, I was on last night. Uh, Judy Woodruff uh, talked to me. It was an honor to meet her, and that program is, is really great. I hope you guys get a chance to check it out. It's changed and improved a lot in recent yeah. times. Um, it's, a, it's a fair question. What else could be done? It was a rapidly growing country. The white population was rapidly growing. There was a massive push to move westward. Um, it was a movement of poor white farmers like Atkinson in our story. It was also a move by, let us call them entrepreneurs, who wanted to expand the territory that was available for slave plantations. Mm -hmm. They wanted to own slaves and grow cotton and make a fortune. They wanted to sell slaves that were getting too numerous in Virginia. They wanted to broaden the market. They wanted to move west. There was this irresistible, it seemed, social force. Uh, driving for land, particularly in the South, although similar things were happening in the North as well. And the question for Jackson or any president is what to do about that. Mm -hmm. The state of Georgia was particularly central in demanding that Cherokees and other Native nations be cleared from its land as soon as possible. Any president was going to be forced to deal with that. Jackson's predecessor, John Quincy Adams, had a different view of Indians and a different policy, but ended up being effectively co-opted in prying the Creek Nation out of their land, their last land in Georgia, because the pressure was so great from below. And the Georgians, even in the 1820s, that's how far back we're going, in the 1820s were talking of civil war, stand to your arms, be ready to fight for your rights. Um, there is a message from 1825 from a governor of Georgia t talking about uh, how there's a conspiracy of Washington elites, <laughs> New York liberals, the unelected justices of the Supreme Court, an attorney general who's the mouthpiece of an untrustworthy president plotting, plotting against the state of Georgia to take away Georgia's slaves and not even pay for them. Um, this is an actual message from the governor of Georgia. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the meaning. Thanks. And Georgia was insisting on its land. Any president was going to have to deal with that. Andrew Jackson did have at least one alternative that was seriously discussed at the time, which is simply continue the old policy. There was a policy that went back to the days of President George Washington which was to encourage the Indian nations to civilize, as white people saw it, to sell them the tools to raise their living standards, which actually could be good for native nations, to uh, sell them that stuff and hope that as they changed their ways from being hunters who needed lots of land, they'd become farmers who didn't need nearly so much land. And what do you know, they, they, would, they would owe money for all the nice clothes and stuff that they bought, and maybe they'd sell white people some land. It was a win-win, consumer capitalism. So there was an old policy that was regarded as more humane that uh, nations like the Cherokees actually did grab onto and get some benefit from. And an alternative was to try to continue that policy. But it would have had to have been ferociously done. Jackson, as president, risked civil war anyway with the state of South Carolina over different issues. He would also have had to risk civil war with the state of Georgia over the question of Indians. There was an alternative, um, but it would have been extremely difficult.
There also, by the way, I'll mention, was John Ross's alternative, which was to make the Cherokee Nation some kind of territory or state as part of the Union. Uh, but that would, have con that would have required completely different racial attitudes than existed in the United States at the time. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Go right ahead, sir. How are you? My Hi. name is uh, Kevin. Kevin. Just, yeah, sorry. I was just wondering, um, have there been any, I'm just curious, me, like meaningful uh, reparations paid um, for the past atrocities and would you support such a uh, policy? No. Okay. <laughs> have there been meaningful reparations paid? There have been, now I, I should mention um, that part of this story is that the Cherokees, through their great resistance, through their many years of resistance, managed to get paid for their land in the end. They were paid at the time $6 million and change, which was a fraction of its value, but at least they were paid something. Um, but have they gotten the land back? No. Uh, in 2009, they did get an apology. How many people knew that the United States has apologized to Indians for mistreatment in the 19th century? Okay, some people knew. That's awesome. It was done in the quietest way possible. Uh, it was a bipartisan measure. I want to say that Sam Brownback of Kansas, who was then in the Senate, may have been behind this, a uh, Republican. Um, it was attached to a defense authorization bill <laughs> and quietly signed by President Obama. No ceremony, no formal anything, but there's language in the law saying we're really sorry. Uh, about this whole land thing and other various abuses, but the language also states that the apology may not be used as a legal basis to recover land. I will say um, some Cherokees remained in the eastern United States. They fled the soldiers who finally came from the, for them in 1838 as the Trail of Tears, which you learned about in school, happened. Um, they remained on their land you can still find them in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, I certainly didn't take a survey, but I spoke with one who said the past is past. We don't want our land back. What we want is the truth to be told. Uh, it was an eloquent statement. And I will say that in Cherokee, North Carolina, instead of having to hide in the hills, as they had to do for a period after 1838, uh, you now go into Cherokee and it's a tourist town. There are moccasin shops, tom-tom shops, restaurants that say Indian owned, which is now a good thing, and a giant Harris casino. Um, so no, there have not been reparations of any kind, but there has been in certain places a kind of integration into American life, maybe a little bit like John Ross would have wanted. Cool. Just a qu really quick follow-up. Sure. Um, would you agree a pol uh, pol of a policy of monetary reparations, or would it be, you know, uh, I'm, this point. Thank you for asking. I'm going to duck that as a journalist. Uh, but I'll be interested if someone makes a serious, a serious play. I would think that at a minimum what you want to assure is that your citizens are fully integrated into American life in the way that they want to be and that their rights, um, that their rights are respected. Uh, I would think that some kind of monetary something is plausible. Recovering the land is probably not. It's been bought over and built over too many times probably for that to be possible. Although I should mention, when you go into Alabama, much of the land that was cleared for white settlement is now empty again. Because, you know, rural areas have emptied out. It's become forest again. If you, if you were a member of the Creek Nation and wanted to go back to Alabama, you could probably find a spot. And some have. There are now small creek reservations back in, in Alabama. Sure. Yes, sir. Bill Montross. Uh, Christian missionaries played a significant role in the education of many of the most influential Cherokees, as well as the Supreme Court cases. Did you reach any conclusion as to whether their influence ultimately served a positive or negative influence? Oh, that is a fascinating question. The last part, positive or negative. You're absolutely right about the facts. That's a huge part of the story. And another way that this felt very modern to me, the early 1800s was a period of religious revival in the United States, of spreading religious interest and also spreading religious political power. Um, and there were missionaries who went among the Indians, among the heathen, as they were called, just as they went to Hawaii and China and other places, any, places, any place they could get, to try to convert the heathen to Christianity. 
or to civilization, which I think for many people at that time was synonymous. And they were missionaries who lived among the, uh, the Cherokees. Uh, I would say that they were in many ways positive for the Cherokees because the Cherokees flipped them. These were representatives of the white world to the native world who were supposed to change the natives, and they won some converts. But they were also persuaded that the Cherokees had rights that should be respected, and so they became messengers from the Indian world back to the white world and said, these people are being abused and must be protected. It was sometimes a patronizing view of protection. They didn't always have respect for the people whose rights they wanted to protect, but sometimes they did. And they helped the Cherokees to plug in to a really powerful network of publishers and politicians and preachers who fought for their rights and defended their rights in very vocal and creative ways for years. Um, the religious political activists of the time are fascinating because there was a kind of religious right that we would recognize as focusing on public morality. Their big thing was that there really ought to be a Sabbath. Everything should stop on Sundays. And their big campaign for years and years was to stop the delivery of the Sunday mail. It was an outrage that, that the mail could be picked up by people at post offices on Sundays. We were all going to hell because of that. Uh, one preacher, when uh, Andrew Jackson was elected, wrote him a letter. And this is the guy who was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, the greatest war hero of his day. And um, he's, the preacher said in the letter that if he would just stop the Sunday mail service while he was president, he would finally distinguish himself as a patriot. <laughs> Jackson was offended by these people for some reason. So there was a recognizable uh, kind of religious right focused on public morality. But often the very same people were performing acts that we would associate with perhaps the modern religious left or pacifist left. They would uh, denounce war. They would add up the perceived f financial cost of the War of 1812, for example, in the same way that people in recent years uh, measured the cost in dollars of the war in Iraq as a way to build opposition. And they also quite vocally and in many cases quite eloquently fought for Indian rights. And one of them, a guy named Jeremiah Everts, suggested to a number of women that perhaps they should campaign for Indian rights. And a number of them did. Even though women could not vote, they started petition campaigns across the country. And it appears to me to be the first example of mass political action by women in the United States. It was on behalf of Indians. Uh, it did not succeed, of course, but it was noticed. And it was memorable. And many of the same people, after they failed to protect Indians, moved on to a different cause and became abolitionists and opposed slavery. The, one of the leaders, one of the organizers of this women's petition movement is a woman named Catherine Beecher, who was an educator whose little sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe who later wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was hugely influential in changing uh, white people's attitudes about slavery. More questions? Go right ahead, sir. Good evening. Eric Someone else with a tie. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you spoke about the slavery and that, that um, the white settlers wanted to bring slavery to that Indian, uh, to Cherokee land. Yes. But also, um, can you speak to about the the Cherokees themselves who own, as I believe, own slaves and in, in plantations. Yes. And the other question I had was um, regarding, if you could speak a little bit about the Supreme Court case with John Marshall. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm just delighted by the, by the depth of knowledge in these questions. Thank you for reminding me uh, of that fact, that yes, uh, Indian nations, while they were busy copying other white practices, took up slavery. And John Ross himself, according to any evidence that I found, was a slave owner. Uh, he didn't write very much at all about his personal life, but there is, there is evidence. Um, and you can kind of see his slaves by inference in some of the things that he wrote in his, in his letters. Um, that is a bitter and difficult and complicated legacy. I have seen 
efforts to minimize it a little bit, and there may have been reason to minimize it a little bit. Uh, it appears that in some of the native nations, some of the African Americans, even if they were classed as slaves, may have enjoyed somewhat more freedom than in white society. In the Seminole tribes, particularly in Florida, some of them rose to positions of considerable leadership. Um, but it occurs to me that it was still slavery. Um, there's just only so much you can do with that. And I would imagine that if you were on uh, the, the large plantation owned by Major Ridge, who was a major Cherokee figure and a major character in this book, I can't imagine that your life was that much better or different than if you were on a white man's plantation 50 miles away. Um, that is part of the legacy here, absolutely part of the story. And it's fascinating to me that it remains part of the story. Um, when the Cherokees and others were removed, the elites who owned slaves were allowed to take their slaves. Um, they have continued to live out west in Oklahoma, and it's a continuing news story which we come across from time to time and cover from time to time because now, rather than being a huge disadvantage to be an Indian, it can be a financial advantage to be an Indian because maybe your tribe has a good casino. And then there are questions about whether the African-American Cherokees or the African-American Creeks get to be classed as Indians, which legally they should be, or not. And there are different tribes that have voted to exclude black people from their own midst. It's a complicated story. It's an ongoing story. And it's one of the reasons that I think of this as a story of two heroic but flawed, deeply flawed men. This is a story of human beings, which I think is another reason that it's a story about democracy. We're all human. Uh, we're all sinners. We all mess up. Hopefully not to that extent, but we all mess up. We all have different views. We all argue with each other through the democratic process. And our hope is that even though so many of us are wrong, over the long run, our different arguments will produce a result that is right, or at least better than it used to be. Thank you. Any other the, questions? The John, or? I'm sorry, the, the John Marshall. Part. Oh, John Marshall, of course. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, John Marshall, the uh, most famous, probably the most influential Chief Justice, was uh, named Chief Justice, I believe, in 1801 by the retiring President John Adams. In the 1830s, he was still there. He was basically one of the founding fathers. He'd been in George Washington's army, and in the 1830s, decades later, he's still Chief Justice. And you're right, the Cherokees sued. It's one of the ways they took advantage of the democratic process. Um, they started their own newspaper. They spread their own propaganda. They built white allies like the Christians that I was describing, uh, and they also sued in the Supreme Court. Uh, they sued once and lost. They sued another time and won. And Marshall wrote a ruling, which you can read excerpts in the book. You can find the whole thing on Google. It's not hard. Um, and it's a, it's a remarkably clear ruling uh, in which Marshall, who was old enough to have seen the whole history of the United States as a country, wrote that it was obvious that Native nations owned the land that they owned, that they had the right to whatever land they had not lost through treaties or wars or purchases of some kind, that they could not be forced to move without their consent, and that they had the right to govern themselves under the umbrella of the federal government, because the nations in that area had signed treaties by that time saying that they would be under the protection of the federal government. It's funny. The word protection was in these treaties. And there were advocates of Indian removal who would say, well, they're under our protection. That means that we can do with them as we think best. And Marshall has a line in his ruling where he says, the word protection does not imply destruction. Um, and he just writes that this is obviously true, that the Cherokees specifically have rights. Um, and essentially, the ruling was ignored. The state of Georgia, which was the defendant, never even sent a lawyer to defend the case, claimed the Supreme Court had no jurisdiction, ignored the findings. It would have required a strong president to impose this ruling on them. Uh, the president at the time was Andrew Jackson, who was a strong president, um, but was angry about the ruling.
and inclined to do nothing. And in the end, what he did was some very quiet political machinations to sort of make the case dissolve, to make the case go away. I had heard, um, and this may be apocryphal, that he stated that, you know, Marshall had his ruling, but let him see if he can enforce it. Uh, yes, that's, that's, a very famous, that's a very famous statement that he may never have exactly said. Um, it was written in a book by Horace Greeley decades later, and historians have questioned whether Andrew Jackson ever said, you know, Judge Marshall has made his ruling, let him enforce it. Maybe he didn't actually say that, but another scholar whom I quote in this book found five or six other contemporary statements that Jackson made, which basically mean all the same thing. Thank you. Certainly. Shall we, some more questions? One more question? One more, okay, great. PJ Ryan. Hi. Knowing what you know, would you support the removal of uh, Jackson from the $20 bill? <laughs> I have answered that question, sir. <laughs> Asked and answered, no. I wrote a thing for the New York Times the other day in which I suggested uh, that the $20 bill would look very nice with John Ross on it. <laughs> and then you flip it over and you have on the other side Andrew Jackson. My argument being that each of these were flawed men who fought in the democratic system and it's part of a great and important American story that should not be forgotten. This is different than a campaign that's gotten a lot of publicity that I think is brilliant to put a woman on the $20 bill. Yeah, go for it, that's great. They've been brilliant, it's a great idea. Um, obviously I've suggested uh, putting two people who are not women on the $20 bill. And so my proposal is a little bit broader than that. It suggests putting two figures on every bill. Pairing up the four founding fathers on there on a couple of bills, and then pairing up people on all the bills so that in effect they tell a story. People of the same era who had different perspectives. You could have Ulysses S. Grant on one side of the $50 bill, whose armies effectively ended the Civil War, and on the other side, you could have Harriet Beecher Stowe, whose book helped to start the Civil War. Um, you could have uh, civil rights figures on both, sides, on both sides of a bill. You could have Rosa Parks on one side and Cesar Chavez on the other. Um, it's an opportunity, I would think, to think really broadly about the incredible diversity in this country. We'll never capture every kind of demographic person on a handful of bills, which we're probably gonna stop using in a few years anyway. But if you put a couple of different figures with different perspectives, then the bill itself tells a story of democracy, which is what we're really about in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.